This episode is part of the pool's Local Officials Stronger Together podcast series. It's one way we serve local officials through integrity, public service, fiscal responsibility, and operational excellence. As always, please direct specific questions about coverage to your risk management advisor. Welcome to episode 9E in the Risk Pool's Stronger Together podcast series. I'm your host, Scott Houston. We've been talking a lot about cybersecurity through multiple channels from the pool. That's because cyber threats are changing, emerging, and growing every day to include city fund attacks, government website attacks, and attacks on water systems and other infrastructure. We want to keep cyber hygiene and prevention in the front of your minds all the time. That's why in this episode, I'll interview a well-known expert in the field, Dr. Michael Ramage. Dr. Ramage will also be presenting a much more comprehensive review of cybersecurity at the 2024 TML Annual Conference and Exhibition, and I've linked to that agenda below the podcast. By all accounts, he's a great presenter, and I'm really looking forward to visiting with him. So let's dive right in. Okay, I'm now joined by Dr. Michael Ramage. Professor Ramage is the director of the Murray State Cyber Education and Research Center in Kentucky. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about what you do at Murray State at the Cyber Research Center. Yeah, I'm happy to. There's a couple of focuses that we have. One, we have a bachelor's program in cybersecurity network management. We have a master's program in cybersecurity management. We have a couple of cybersecurity certificates at both the undergraduate level and then one at the master's level. There's a there's an education academic component, but there's also an outreach component that I help out with. And that's both on a recruitment standpoint, job placement standpoint for our students, but then also just helping to serve communities and organizations both around our region, around our state, and even around the country often and trying to help them stay a little bit safer. We do that in a number of ways. We do that through outreach events, speaking opportunities. Uh, We also do that through research. As you mentioned, we're a research center. We have done uh, a lot of research over the years, both in training type of research, but also with Homeland Security. One research project that we worked on, which I find really interesting was what happens if GPS fails to work? And uh, Homeland Security was looking at some of the, the requirements that if they developed a redundant system, what would that system have to be able to do? And so we would do some research on that and, and a variety of other things throughout time. But the outreach piece is really important to me because I know that there's so many organizations, governments, both agencies and local governments and even state government agencies that just really need help and don't have the manpower to do the things that, frankly, they need to do to stay safe in today's world. So that's a big part of what I do on a pretty regular basis. Well, that's amazing. And thank you for what you do. It's so important both to educate the the young people to be experts in this field and then also the outreach. And that's something that we're doing at the pool. We have a dedicated cyber risk services manager that we've had for a couple of years. And then we've just added a new position to supplement that. So cyber is one of the biggest threats facing local governments, just like any other sector of the country. You and I got connected, actually, because Jeff Thompson, the pool's executive director, recently heard you speak at a conference and said uh, your presentation was outstanding. And we, based on that, invited you to come speak at the Texas Municipal League Annual Conference in Houston this October. And so what I kind of wanted this podcast to be is sort of a teaser about what's to come, but also have some great standalone substantive info for our members. Let's talk a little bit about what you've been doing. If you go back 20 years, you had the word hacker, and and the hacker back then was just trying to see if they could do stuff. You know, can I deface your website? Okay, it's annoying if they do it, but it's not that big of a deal. Or can I break into your system? I just want to do it because I want to see if I can do it. That was the mindset of of the hacker 20 years ago. Fast forward, that's not the case anymore, and now it's about a business. It is 
hackers it's criminal organizations that function like a business and, and as silly as this sounds they use salesforce to manage their their customers their victims just like a real business would it's about making money and with that as the mindset it is one of those if if I wanted to spend, if I had enough money, time, and energy, there is no organization in the world that's that's not hackable. Everybody's hackable. The piece of it comes into play of, is it worth the return on investment for a hacker to spend X amount of money to break into your system? When I talk to communities, I always try to help them start with the little things because an attacker is going to always pick the low hanging fruit first and you don't want that low hanging fruit to be you. Right. If you read the statistics, most of the attacks nowadays, like upwards of over 90% are because of human error, meaning because you clicked the link because you did something and you opened the door and let the bad guy in without realizing it. I spent a lot of time through presentation to just hear some basic things that we need to do that we need to keep in mind to make sure that we're doing the things to secure our organizations, to secure our, our communities, and, and frankly, keep our families safe. Right. And I'll talk a little bit about in our action items that we do, I'll talk about some of the things that the risk pool offers to our members. And we even will offer them to cities that are not members of the pool related to preventative measures. And these are, like you said, fairly simple things. Ryan Burns, our cyber risk services manager, always uses the acronym PICNIC. The problem is in the chair, not in the computer. And it's so, so often the case. There's another podcast episode, episode 9D, where I talk with Jessica Rogers, assistant city manager in the city of Tomball, about a hack that they had that they ended up paying a ransom on. And it was a very long recovery that they're still recovering from. It's been almost over a year now that they're still recovering from that. So I'd encourage city officials to listen to that if they think it can't happen to them. Appreciate that background. And I, and I think it's very important that our members know that. So from a substantive perspective, This podcast is really directed more towards elected officials, city managers, and city attorneys. So it's really a higher level. But we always try to infuse a culture of safety when we talk about our risk management. And we also want to infuse a culture of cyber hygiene to those folks. Let's talk about maybe just a couple cybersecurity points you think are the most important thing from a high level for a local official to know. There's a couple things I always start with. Passwords. Multi-factor authentication, uh, having that second factor is extremely important. I can go into a lot of details about that. Having strong, unique passwords and multi-factor authentication are, are must. Because of the issue of, of the human element, having security awareness training is a must. And then the last piece, that, and there's a lot more that I can get into, that ransomware attack that you mentioned, if you don't have good secure backups, then there is never going to be a question of whether or not you pay the ransom. You have to have backups or your hands are tied. You have to have backups that are secure, meaning that they're not connected to your network in the sense that if your network gets encrypted, that your backups aren't held for ransom as well. So those three things are where I always suggest folks to start. But actually, the thing that I always, and and people hate me for this, the place I always encourage folks to start before that is with the policy side. And the reason I do that is that if you're doing all of these things to secure your community, you really don't know where to start if you don't have a policy, if you don't have a plan of some form or fashion, whether it's a template that they get from TML or if it's a template from the Science Institute or they develop it on their own, hopefully with, with experts, you don't really know where or what you have to secure. And so that policy is really going to help you dictate this is why I need passwords and this is why I need multi-factor authentication. And this is why I need endpoint security or, or to integrate zero trust or to test or whatever it might be. If you think you have strong backups yet you don't know where your data is all being stored, then it is impossible for you to have backups Mm -hmm. uh, that are proper. Mm -hmm. So that policy really helps to kind of 
provide that strategic planning component to guide the security of your organization. Right. So those are, those would be the things where I would start. So those are they're fundamental, but they're important. And it's interesting because I've mentioned this on a few podcasts before, but I have a, a former colleague of mine who was talking about the Public Information Act in Texas and how some of his city officials kind of lamented when they got a bunch of requests from one person. And it took up a lot of time and all that. And he actually laid it pretty bare when he said to them, in addition to being in the streets business, the police and fire business, the utility business, the economic development business, you're also in the information business. And I think that's uh, apropos here, because in addition to all those things, they also need to be in the IT cybersecurity business as well. It's just a must. It's it's part of doing business nowadays, right? I mean, it should be. And the problem is, and, and I can point to some pretty large communities across the country that have been hit with attacks that I, I talked to one community, a large community, and their city manager, their county manager actually, said that they couldn't get people to realize the importance of security because constituents see potholes. They don't see security flaws, but they got hit with a massive uh, cyber attack. And now in four months, they've spent $7 million. Yeah. So it's like, it's one of those pieces that you're in that business, whether you realize it or not, if you invest that money on the front end, you're going to save a lot more money than if you have to do it on the back end. And 4 million bucks can fill a heck of a lot of potholes, can it? <laughs> it can. That's right. It, that filling those potholes are going to get me reelected. Yeah. And that's the mindset that so many communities have. It's like, how can I show good stewardship of dollars to constituents and they can see the potholes being addressed. That's They can't see the security piece being addressed. I have a Nissan Pathfinder and I got a notice a couple of weeks ago that it had a recall and then I also needed my brakes, uh, rear brake pads fixed, uh, changed. And I went on the website to schedule my appointment, which is how I always do it. It's very easy. You go pick your date and your time and it sets you up with an appointment. You don't have to even talk to anybody. But that box on the website was just totally blank. There was nothing there. I thought, well, what the heck? And so I called the dealership and I said, hey, I need to schedule this service. And he said, well, we can't schedule service. We can't do anything right now. And that's because obviously of the CDK global hack, yeah, which was, right. is a hack that I think most people have probably seen it. It's been number one in the headlines that affected just about every car dealership's uh, service and customer management software in the United States. And they just were stopped. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't do it by paper. They didn't have their customer information. It's just a complete disaster and it's still going on. And, uh, you know, I've read that it's a billion dollar loss thus far and that it could affect as much as one percent of the United States GDP for the year. I mean, it's insanely widespread and insanely uh, detrimental. That's the kind of thing that the pool is worried about because a lot of our members use the same software to manage different things, courts, public information, utility billing, all those things. I just thought I might ask you to comment on that and and tell me what you think about it. I don't know if I have a particular yeah. question, just what you think about it. Yeah, well, it, a big piece, so there's, there's two parts. I'm going to attack this from different perspectives. Part one is that's a billion-dollar impact. I'm a small little community. Nobody cares. And, and actually, I read some research last week that said small businesses, small organizations are being attacked at a higher rate than large organizations. The amount of money, if you're a hacker, if you're a criminal organization, that you could spend to attack a billion dollar impact is much higher than your community, but your community is going to be much easier to break into than that large uh, attack. When you see this, think, well, you know, I don't have that much money, so they won't care about me. That's just not true, first of all. On the flip side, we have to trust these types of, of providers, whether it's this type of software or if it's you know Microsoft or whoever it might be, we can't get around the world today without some trust in other providers. But that supply chain, whether it is you purchasing a product, physical product that you depend on to be of good quality, 
or it's software or it's an online service that we trust to be there. We have to place that trust in something, but at the same time, having some contingency plan or some you know, some risk assessment on what if is really important. Can we address this situation? Maybe, maybe not. But there's a lot of other providers that don't do anything. And, and honestly, I don't know how much preventative controls they had in place to begin with or how much they had in place. But we need to do our due diligence to make sure that people that we're putting in organizations that we're putting our trust in have prepared their systems securely to try to to do everything they can to stop this from happening. Is it going to still happen? Absolutely. There's going to be cyber attacks every day for the rest of our lives. It just it is going to be that way. But we want to minimize the risk to our organization and do the best job we can in planning ahead of time. That's outstanding, man. I'm really excited to have had the chance to visit with you here. And we're super excited for your presentation at the TML Annual Conference. Looking forward to being with you in person in October as well. Okay, let's do your usual action items to help you get everything you can from our partnership. Action item number one, if you'll be at the 2024 TML Annual Conference, be sure to attend Michael's concurrent session at 9 a.m. on Friday, October 11th. In the meantime, you can check out his weekly YouTube videos. I asked him about those, and here's what he had to say. The video series is called 10 at 10. So the idea is that at 10 o'clock every Friday for 10 minutes, I talk about some aspect of cybersecurity. We've been doing that since January, I guess, 185 episodes, uh, 185 weeks we've been doing this. So uh, in January, it'll be four years that we've been doing this. I've linked info about both of those below. Action item number two. Be sure to watch our latest edition of our 10-minute CyberBytes YouTube video installment, which is also linked below. In episode number three, Ryan Burns talks once again with our friend Hacker Hank, this time to explain how to avoid falling for a fraudulent money transfer scheme. These videos are actually super funny, but they're also packed with great information. You can also find DIR certified training with Ryan and Hank on our YouTube channel as well. And finally, action item number three. The pool is rolling out new cyber coverage as we speak, and your entity has to execute and return a new interlocal agreement to participate. You should have already received a mailed and email packet with details. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening, and remember to be cyber smart. To review written materials associated with the presentation or to ask Scott a question, please visit www.tml.com. IRP.org and click on the Stronger Together podcast link. Please remember that the information in this episode is provided for informational purposes only and doesn't constitute legal advice. We recommend that you review the podcast and the accompanying written materials with your attorney prior to taking action.